Well, good evening. Welcome back. If you want to go ahead and make your way back to Galatians chapter 3 tonight. Galatians chapter 3, it's been a few weeks since we've looked at Galatians, and we're going to pick up in reading chapter 3. I want us to read those first five verses tonight. Galatians chapter 3, beginning in verse number 1. Paul writes, you foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? Before whose eyes Jesus Christ was publicly portrayed as crucified. This is the only thing I want to find out from you. Did you receive the Spirit by the works of the law or by hearing with faith? Are you so foolish, having begun by the Spirit, are you now being perfected by the flesh? Did you suffer so many things in vain, if indeed it was in vain? So then, does he who provides you with the Spirit and works miracles among you do it by the works of the law or by hearing with faith? This is the word of our Lord. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, we give thanks for your word. We thank you for the clarity that it gives to us in understanding what pleases you. And we know that without faith, it is impossible to please you. And so we come tonight in faith through your Son, trusting that you would speak to us through your Word, that we might be reminded of the hope that we have in Christ that we might be reminded that we are justified in our standing before you only through our faith in him. Lord, we thank you for the season of, of rest that we've had this last month, and we ask that as we begin this new season, that you would strengthen us for the work that you have us to do that you would equip us and you would encourage us and edify us through this time tonight. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, this is picking up right back in the middle of Galatians. We stopped in at the end of May. And as you read this, it's really not hard to imagine the righteous anger that's really mixed with heartbreak that the Apostle Paul had for the church at Galatia. As we began this letter in that first chapter, you see right off the bat the Apostle's righteous anger. In fact, he, he forgoes the normal pleasantries and instead goes immediately to rebuke the Galatians for deserting the gospel of grace. And I, and I have no doubt that Paul replayed this in his mind, how... God had prepared the Galatians to receive the gospel of grace that he preached. And, and I say that really based on, if you want to turn with me to chapter 4 for just a moment, because he, he tells us, he gives us a word concerning that very thing in chapter 4, verse number 11. He says, I fear for you that perhaps I have labored over you in vain. I beg of you, brethren, become as I am. For I also have become as you are. You have done me no wrong. But you know that it was because of a bodily illness that I preached the gospel to you the first time. And, and that which was a trial to you in my bodily condition, you did not despise or loathe. But you received me as an angel of God, as Christ Jesus himself. Where then is that sense of blessing you had. For I hear you witness that if possible, you would have plucked out your eyes and given them to me. Paul is saying that you would have, you've received me as an angel of God, as a messenger of God, as Christ Jesus himself. But now the things have changed. Going back to chapter 3, we know that it's through the influence of the Judaizers, this legalistic approach to salvation. 
that they had exchanged the pure gospel of grace for a polluted gospel that was mixed with the law, which in itself, as he says in chapter 1 and verse 6, is no gospel at all. They were acting as if they were under some kind of spell, having lost their spiritual senses. And so they had turned from grace to the law, from faith to works. And so Paul is writing this in an attempt to draw them back, to remind them. And I want to emphasize this because there's always a question about whether or not they're saved. And, and, and if they are in Christ Jesus, they are saved. But it is possible to be positionally in Christ and yet lose the joy that you once had in salvation. So as they're attempting to live the new life that is in Christ Jesus, these Galatians had imposed upon themselves a kind of legalism. If you know anything about legalism, it, it robs us of our joy and our freedom that's in Christ Jesus. It's when we take our eyes off Christ and we start looking to ourselves and our standing before God that we begin down that slippery slope of a bondage that robs us of the joy that we once enjoyed in Christ. So Paul wants to remind them, he's already taught them, but he wants to remind them of what he's taught them before. He, it's not a new gospel. I mean, Paul's going right back to the basics, and he's reminding them of the gospel. And, and in fact, as you look at chapters 3 and 4, it's really all about being justified by Christ alone. That's, that comes out of the end of chapter 2, and it leads into these two chapters. And so he, for the next two chapters, he's going to be talking about that we are justified by Christ alone. He's going to give a defense of justification by faith in these next two chapters. And the way that he's going to do that in, in, in these first five verses, which is what we're going to look at tonight, he's going to do that by asking them to remember their own experience. Their own experience of coming to faith in Christ and their own experience of, of being saved through the gospel that it was just, they were justified by faith and faith alone. And then in the rest of chapter 3 and all the way through chapter 4, as we will go forward, he's going to give them a defense, a scriptural defense, and a demonstration that that's what the scriptures teach, that that's the only way that we can be justified before God is through faith in Christ. So I, I want to do this. I just want to take a few moments tonight and look at these first five verses as, as Paul is, is going to point back to their own experience of being justified by faith in Christ. And as you read that tonight, I, I want you to think about that for yourself. I want you to think about your own salvation and, and if you're a believer in Christ and, and how it is that you came to faith in Christ. And think about your own experience in that as we walk through these verses. It's really interesting because the way that he lays this out, that it really relates to the triune Godhead. In other words, as he talks about our experience, there's really three ways, and I'll just give you those points right up front. He talks about our experience with Christ, that's in verse number one, our experience with the Holy Spirit in verses two through four, and then our experience with the Father is recorded in verse five. So let's walk through that together. Beginning in verse number one, I want you to notice the first thing that he emphasizes is the believer's experience with Christ. And notice how he words this in verse number one, you foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you, before whose eyes Jesus Christ was publicly portrayed as crucified. And so he begins with you foolish Galatians. He, he, he doesn't stop there. In fact, if you look down at verse number three, he tells them again. He does the same thing. He says, are you so foolish? That sounds really harsh as you're thinking about writing a letter. But we need to remind ourselves that the Apostle Paul loved these people. He, he loved the church at Galatia. And like a father who calls out his child, Paul is saying that you're really acting foolish. You know, sometimes we have to say hard things to people that we love. And that's what he's doing here. He's saying that you're acting foolishly. Now, this word foolish, it's not 
Uh, it doesn't mean stupid. It, he, he's not saying that you're morally or you're mentally deficient. He, he's not saying that you're idiots. Uh, he's saying that you are foolish. He's saying that you are being careless and lazy in your spiritual thinking. And, and, and I think what is so interesting about that is the Apostle Paul was so careful in how he handled the gospel. We see that in his letter. You know, that, that's important for us to realize that, that doctrine needs to be precise. It needs to be exact. We, we need to make sure. In fact, that's where a lot of heresy comes from is by not being precise in our doctrine. Well, for them... They had become spiritually lazy. They'd sat under the apostles' teaching, and they knew that he had carefully taught them the gospel of grace, and yet they had exchanged the truth for a lie. They had drifted away. And to use an old expression, they had taken the teaching of the Judaizers, this legalistic teaching, hook, line, and sinker. They actually, their, their judgment was clouded. They just weren't thinking right. What they should have done is they should have, upon hearing the Judaizers, they should have took what the Judaizers said and took it back to the Word of God. What does the Word of God say? And go back to the basics of the gospel, the basic truths of the gospel. But instead, they followed their whims and their impulses rather than God's revealed truth. You know, over the years, I've encountered believers who have fallen in the same snare. They've heard some teaching, maybe they've heard it on YouTube, or they've heard uh, another site, and, and it feels right, or it often appeals to their emotions. But the Christian life is neither entered into, nor is it lived on the basis of good feelings. It, it's not about the attractive inclinations, but it's on the basis of the Word of God. It is the truth. They had become, as Paul talks to the Ephesians in chapter 4 and verse 14, they had become tossed here and there by waves and carried away by every wind of doctrine, by the trickery of men, by craftiness and deceitful scheming. It's dangerous when we allow our emotions or we hear something that is appealing and we don't take it back to the Word of God. That's exactly what they had done. When Paul is talking to the church at Rome, you recall in chapter 12, in those first two verses, he's urging them by the mercies of God not to be conformed to this world, but to be transformed by what? By the renewing of your mind. It is the Word that gives us the, the right way that we should be thinking about teaching. When you hear teaching, you ought to take it back to the Word. They hadn't done that. And, in fact, they had bought into this legalistic, law-abiding kind of gospel, which is not the gospel at all. They, and what they had done, and, and by the way, one of the things about this is it, it appeals to the ego. Uh, you, you know something is wrong if there is pride involved or arrogance involved. I mean, if we had something to do with our salvation... If we have something to offer to God, then it's not all of grace. It's only in Christ that we have anything that we can offer to Him. Paul's question to them is, who has bewitched you? He knows the obvious answer to that. It's the Galatians. It is the Judaizers who have bewitched the Galatians. But this word bewitched actually comes from a word that means to, to charm or or fascinate in a misleading way. It often comes through flattery or false promises. This word actually, it could carry the idea of sorcery, but that's not what's going on here. They're not some victims of a magical spell. No, they, the Judaizers had tickled their fancy. They had, they had appealed to their flesh. They'd sold them a false bill of sales, and the Galatians had bought it. Now, now I, want you to see, I want you to think about this, because 
They're, they're listening to the teaching, this false teaching, and it's not like they're being forced to do so. They love it. They've embraced it. And they're convinced that faith wasn't enough, that, that something was lacking. And so the Judaizers, are ped, they're, they're peddling this flesh-pleasing righteousness that comes by works as if something is lacking in our standing before God, that faith is not enough, that there has to be a returning to the ceremonies and the requirements of the Old Covenant. And so Paul says, who has bewitched you? Who's convinced you of this? And then he does this. He, he begins to, to reason about their experience of salvation. And now we see that at the end of verse number 1. Notice how he puts it. He says, before whose eyes Jesus Christ was publicly portrayed as crucified. What does that mean? He, he's talking to the Galatians. Who's bewitched you before whose eyes? In other words, before your eyes, Jesus Christ was publicly portrayed or crucified. Let me give you a little bit of help here with the word portrayed. It, it actually was used of posting important official documents in the marketplace so citizens could read it. Jesus Christ was publicly like, like a document before them that could be read, crucified. So, some people think that this actually, uh, some, some scholars think that what it's referring to here is it's pointing to the historical point that Jesus was crucified. But I, I don't think that's what he's saying. What, what he's saying to the Galatian is, before your eyes, Jesus Christ was publicly portrayed as crucified. In, in other words, what, he, what he's saying is, you Galatians have seen and believed by faith and understood that Christ was crucified you understand, you, you understood the atonement that, that Christ paid for your sins. That He satisfied the wrath of God. That, that, what, what He's saying to them is that your, your heart, your, your mind was transformed through the, through the gospel by seeing Christ, by reading and understanding that Christ made atonement for your sin. It had come to them with full clarity. They could read it like a script. They, they had known it. They have seen it. It's almost like they could see Jesus being hammered to the cross. They see the blood. They see the, 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 the brow. The... They see Christ. And the reason that He went to the cross, they understood that. Who has bewitched you? You, you understand that He made... Atonement for your sin, that he satisfied the wrath of God. In fact, this word crucified, actually the tense of it means that it had happened, but it has an ongoing, a continual effect. If you want to know the Greek about that, it's, the, it's in the perfect passive participle. In other words, it is something that happened, but it has a continuing effect. And so what he's saying is, is that you know that Christ died for your sin. You, you, you know, you've seen that. You've seen Him presented. Probably a reference to the preaching of the gospel that, that Paul had given them. You, you've seen this, and you know this, and His crucifixion has an ongoing effect. In other words, He, having made atonement for your sin, satisfies your standing before God always and forever, eternally. You've seen it. You know this. This is your experience with Christ. And, and to say that I need to add something now to have a standing before God, do you see how that diminishes the work of Christ? you see how that, that takes away from what Christ has done? It belittles. It, may, it makes Him look like you needed to do something. You needed to add something to that. No. No. Jesus is sufficient. His atonement is sufficient. He, he, his sacrifice is satisfactory. It is pleasing to God. There's nothing that needs to be added to that. That was your experience. You knew this. You understood this from the teaching. I, I spelled it out for you. How were you bewitched? 
How, how have you become so foolish? And he doesn't stop there with the experience of Christ. He moves on in verses 2 through 4 to talk about the experience that they had with the Holy Spirit. Again, he's appealing to them. Don't you remember what the Spirit accomplished in your lives when you trusted Christ for salvation? He, he narrows the focus down in verse number 2 when he says this, this. This is the only thing I want to find out from you. I, I, I want to find this out from you. Did you receive the Spirit by the works of the law or by hearing with faith? I mean, just hearing that, you, you, know, you know the answer to that. Did you have to fill, fulfill some further requirement? Did you have to do some kind of special ceremony or perform some kind of additional rite? Or did you receive the Spirit of God's grace at the same time you received Christ as your Lord and Savior? And, and we could camp out here, but this is, this is very significant in understanding the theology of the Holy Spirit is that the gift of the Holy Spirit is the believer's most unmistakable evidence of God's favor, his greatest proof of salvation, and the guarantee of eternal glory. Listen to what Paul said in Romans chapter 8, verse 16. He says, The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we're children of God. Conversely, Paul says in Romans 8 and 9, if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he does not belong to him. Now just let that sink in. If you have the Spirit, then you are a child of God. If you don't have the Spirit, then you don't belong to him. 1 John 4, 13, by this we know that we abide in him, speaking of Christ, and Christ in us, because he has given us of his Spirit. It's ludicrous, it's ludicrous to maintain, as some Christians do, that the full gift of the Holy Spirit comes through something additional. That you've got to do some kind of work. No, we receive the Holy Spirit at the moment of conversion. When we believe. In fact, as we noted when we were in the book of Ephesians, chapter 1 and verse 13 and 14, you, you know that having believed in Christ that you are sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. You, you know what that is, being sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. Y'all remember that? It, that the Holy Spirit, he, he's the earnest pledge. It says that he's given us as a pledge of our inheritance. And that word pledge means a, a down payment or earnest money. Anybody who's ever purchased a house, you know that. Well, we are the house of God. He has given us the Holy Spirit as a pledge to, that He will complete this work in us. And, and again, I think it's important that we realize this, that we receive the Holy Spirit at the moment of conversion. And, and He's reminding them, it's not by works of the law that you receive the Holy Spirit, but, but by hearing in faith. And yet we know, and you probably have heard of groups that say that you need a second work to receive the Holy Spirit. You need a, 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 a blessing to receive the Holy Spirit. No, the blessing of the Holy Spirit comes at the moment of salvation, the moment of conversion. I went to um, Bible college with, with a guy that, we, we were close friends who had grown up in a very charismatic church of God. And, and he, he confessed to me that they, he would spend hours in the altar praying to receive the Holy Spirit. He said, I was a believer. This is what he was told. I was a believer, but I needed the Holy Spirit. And the evidence of the Holy Spirit was that I was speaking in tongues. And so, and so because I was not speaking in tongues, because I couldn't speak in tongues, they said I didn't have the Holy Spirit. And, and he, he, he told me about this, that they, would, they actually would hold up his arm. He said, my arms would just, I would just be exhausted from praying. And he said, I, I would weep because I couldn't speak in tongues. 
But you know, if, if speaking in tongues were evidence that you were that that were evidence that you were saved, if it were necessary, then certainly John would have written it in his epistle. Because John writes that these things I have written to you who believe on the name of the Son. You know the verse. I think it's 1 John 5, 13. He didn't mention tongues in there. No. This idea that there is something additional that we need, God gives us the Holy Spirit at the moment of salvation. And God doesn't save us on the installment plan. You don't get his leg one week and his arm next week. You get all the Holy Spirit that you're going to get. And we spend our life giving up ourselves to him. He gets all of us, or we get all of him, and then through our walk with him of surrender, he gets all of us. The goal, I love how John MacArthur put this. He said, the Holy Spirit is not the goal of the Christian life, but its source. Look at verse number three. He says, having begun by the Spirit, Paul continues, are, are you now being perfected by the flesh? You, you begun, in other words, the way that you began is, is by faith, and you receive the grace, the, the Spirit through grace, are you now having to be perfected by the flesh? No, it's, it's by faith. I mean, how could you think that your weak, imperfect, and sinful flesh could improve upon what the Spirit of God began in you when you first believed? So they had drifted from grace and moved to the law. And Paul's appealing to them. I mean, that's not how you receive the Spirit of God. Notice what he says in verse number four. Did you suffer so many things in vain? Now, this is kind of strange, but suffer, actually, it, it could speak of, of a, a difficulty or a hardship, even pain. But it also speaks of experience, and I think in context, that's what he's talking about. It, did you experience so many things in vain? I mean, what's been your experience of receiving the Holy Spirit? What's been your experience of being in Christ? Didn't you learn anything from this? I mean, how, how can you think that the claims of the Judaizers would square with the gospel that you were taught and believed and experienced yourself? If indeed, he says, it was in vain. He leaves open the possibility and hope that it was not. In other words, I hope that what I've heard about you is not true. That you, and that you come back to your senses. So he talks about their relationship, their experience, his experience with Jesus, the experience with the Holy Spirit, and then finally your experience with the Father. Verse 5, so then, does he, and it speaks of the Father, does he who provides you with the Spirit and works miracles among you do it by the works of the law or by hearing with faith? So it is the, the Lord who provides you with the Spirit. And, and it, we know it's the Lord because when Jesus, before his ascension, you remember that he told the disciples not to leave Jerusalem. And in Acts chapter 1, verse 4, he, he, he tells them to, to wait until they receive what was promised, which was the Holy Spirit. And even... Jesus talks about the Holy Spirit coming from the Father. In fact, in Luke chapter 11, verse 13, through the Son, the Father had promised to give the Holy Spirit to those who ask Him. And, and before I move off this to close this out, I just, I just want to emphasize one last thing about the Holy Spirit. And we'll come back to the Father making this provision. And, 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 it's, and it's a generous provision that he gives us. But the Spirit is a person. And I know that's very elementary, but I think we need to be reminded of that again. 
that He is a person. It, it, he's not, the, the Spirit is not some force, it's not, it's not some mystical um, power that's out there. He is a person. The Holy Spirit is the third person of the triune Godhead. In fact, I, I want you to listen. I, I remember some years ago I was talking to a Jehovah's Witness and, and uh, we were talking about the Holy Spirit, and they don't believe in the Trinity and didn't believe in the Holy Spirit being a person. And, uh, and I took them to this passage of Scripture in John chapter 16, verse 13. And I just want you to notice the pronouns. John 16, verse 13, talking about the Spirit of truth. And, and when He, the Spirit of truth, comes, He will guide you into all the truth, for he will not speak on his own initiative, but whatever he hears, he will speak. He, the Spirit of truth, is the third person of the triune Godhead. And he's saying, remember your experience that he provided you with the Spirit. Again, this word provide means to supply abundantly and with great generosity. And with generosity to His children, God provided them with the Spirit. And notice this, and works miracles among you. That word miracles is dunamis. You recognize that, dynamite, power. He does this great work. Is He talking about what kind of miracles? Is He talking about? He didn't specify, but we know that regeneration is a miracle. That, the, that, that when the Spirit regenerates us and makes us into a new creation in Christ Jesus, we, we know that it's a miracle that we're translated from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of light. We, we know it's a miracle that we once were slaves and in bondage to sin, but through the Holy Spirit and it's our freedom that is in Christ Jesus now that we have the power to live and to be able to overcome our sin, uh, all of this. Does he tell us what it is? We know that it's just the working of the power. That God is at work. He provides you with the Spirit. He works miracles among you. He didn't know it by works of the law. How does he do it? By hearing with faith. We know on speaking of this power that God is able to do far more abundantly beyond all that we can ask according to the power that works within his dunamis. So he appeals to them. Think back of your salvation. What were you saved by? Think back to your experience with Christ. You look to Christ and Christ alone for salvation. How did you receive the Spirit? Did you have to do anything to do so? Did you have to work something up? No, you receive the Spirit by grace. And what has God done in your midst? Having come to Christ and having given us His Holy Spirit, which He promised that He would give, have you not seen the power of the Gospel at work in your life? Oh, don't be foolish. Don't let anyone bewitch you. Your standing before God is by grace alone, by faith alone, in Christ alone. Let's pray together. Father, we are grateful that we are not left to our own reasoning and rationale to think how we might be acceptable in your sight. But Lord, you have made it very clear through the pure gospel of grace that it is only through your Son that we can have a standing before you. Thank you for those who are faithful to proclaim the purity of the gospel. And thank you for the
power that comes through the gospel to those who believe. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.